Yes, but it comes up over there, huh? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to do the talking this morning? Yes. Good morning, all. I'm no doubt that uh, the minister will welcome you when he comes, but a welcome in any case. And God bless you all. Start off with 106. This is the day. Next one is 116, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee. Warming up, let's see if we can improve on that and the third one. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. <coughs> that is, sorry, one, one, three, four. Yeah. 
needs are great. Let us give a moment thought to those that are in need, those that are traveling, those that are battling with life. Please concentrate on your personal needs and on those needs. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers, and thank you that you answer them. Not always in the way we expect, but in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, the last one I think will be 315, there's a river of life. Thank you. God bless. Have a good day, good week, good month, good year. Morning, everyone. God bless you all this morning. Just look around you. Get used to it. We're going to spend eternity together. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Or... <laughs> nice to see you all this morning. Bernie, thank you for doing that ramp for us. We really appreciate it. Can we give Bernie a hand, please? That's going to help a lot of people. Thank you, Bernie. If we have any visitors this morning, welcome. We have two new cards in front of you in the pew. One is a welcome card and the other is an information card. The information card is just to update anything that you might need to tell us. And the welcome card, of course, is for the new people. So please fill them in when you need to. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start off by uh, giving Delm a very special welcome this morning. And Delm, we pray that you have a lovely break and a nice holiday. Weather good. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, although... <laughs> uh, 10 Spearman Road. Um, if you'd like to see your flyer in today's bulletin, please come and have some fellowship and do some work at 10 Spearman Road. And uh, ladies are included. Please come along, ladies, if you like to do some gardening. 
I have a little story to tell you. Um, people, any people here know Peter Masson? Good. Well, he's a hero. He got into a lift, and the, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. A lady, a lady got into a lift in their complex, and she broke her oxygen pipe. And Peter stepped in and gave her oxygen pipe, and she had it for two days. And Peter so chuffed with himself, and rightly so. And he even got a mention in their little news bulletin. So well done, Peter. <laughs> Please don't forget the Wesley Day of Prayer and Fasting for elections tomorrow, and it's at Presbury on Tuesday. And um, why not come and join us for prayer at half past three in the afternoon tomorrow? Make a nice big crowd, and it'll be a nice time of prayer and fellowship. Uh, just turning over to the uh, news bullet, uh, notice board, I beg your pardon. Men's breakfast on the 23rd of July. Guest speaker is Eric Tocknell. Apparently he's a very good speaker. And Phil Davies will be up at the top afterwards to take the men's name, so please do that. And the WA are having a cake sale after the service this morning. Please remember that. And I've, I've mentioned the prayer on the elections. Noreen would like to have a few words and then I'd like to ask Brian and Renette to come and do the Luknos afterwards. Thank you very much. Morning everyone. I bring you greetings from the Nasna Methodist Church, the Reverend Rodney Jamison. Lovely gentleman gave me a big hug and said, uh, give my regards to Wesley. So I said, yes, I would. It's a beautiful old church with magnificent stained glass windows for those that haven't been in it. The second thing I want to say is a big thank you to everyone at Wesley. It's five years today since my husband died and I would not have been able to cope without you as a family because those of you who know me, I have no children, so you've been my family and my support. And the hugs I get on a Sunday mean a lot to me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let us be quiet for a moment. Give us, we pray, gentle God, a mind forgetful of past injury, a will to seek the good of others, and a heart of love, that we may learn to live in the way of our Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back at Wesley to, today. In case you think I've been bunking the last couple of weeks, I have been working. i um, been sharing at Presbury um, over the last couple of Sundays, but it's good to be uh, at Wesley again. Um, let me extend my welcome to you, and especially to uh, where's Amy Lee and Bryn? Where were you sitting? There you are, there. There you go. Thanks for coming to be with the Granny and Grandpa. Um, special. Yeah, special for you to be there with them. Got you up early this morning, hey? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can wipe the sleep out of your eyes later on. It's all right. Yeah. And uh, to Trevor and Maureen also. Where's Trevor and Maureen? 58 years, wedding anniversary yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> Married long before I was even born. That's a... That's a <laughs> 
Um, I know that Bob has mentioned many of the notices already. Um, the, the one that I wanted to just link in with the men's breakfast is uh, on the notices you'll see there's a, a, a prayer walk on the 23rd of July. It's called Peter Maritzburg Prayer Walk, which is involving all the churches from Maritzburg. So um, if, you, if you are coming to the men's breakfast, the prayer actually is taking place at 10 o'clock at the city hall. Um, for those energetic people, you can walk from 9 o'clock from various locations to the city hall, kind of imagining people from all around Maritzburg converging on the city hall and then praying for our city, which is a wonderful thing. Um, it seems like the Saturday, the 23rd of July, is the only day in the year that we can do all of these events because like, there's about 20 different events happening in Maritzburg. But uh, the men, when we're fed up, we can then go and pray at the city hall. Um, but the ladies can maybe also join us there on the 23rd of July. Good, let's, uh, let's continue to worship God as we sing, this time from the hymn book, um, Come My Soul uh, is hymn number 546, and I ask us to stand as we worship together. Please join me as we pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you are our God, you are our guide, and you are our friend, as we've just sung. We thank you that as we uh, carry through uh, every day on this life, that we don't do it alone, that we have a community of faith, that we have people around us who can encourage us, but ultimately, Lord, today we give you thanks for your spirit, the spirit that lives within us, that dwells within us, that gives us life, that reminds us that we are your children, and that keeps pointing us to you, Jesus. We're also grateful today on this, the Communion Sunday, Lord God, for your blood that was spilt for us, that you loved us so much that you died on the cross so that we would find uh, a place of grace that we would find forgiveness, that the burden of our sin would not have to drag us down, but that we could be set free. And so in all that we do this morning in our worship, may it all prepare us for that moment of grace where we receive the, the bread and the grape juice as a reminder of your great sacrifice for us. Lord, today we want to reaffirm you as our Lord and our Savior. We reflect on 
how perhaps in the past week we have been distracted by other things. Perhaps at times we have been tempted to place our trust in other people or in other things uh, and turn our eyes away from you. We confess that now in this moment, Lord, and we pray that you would forgive us. We reclaim you as, as our Lord and our Savior. As we bring the prayer to a close, I invite us to pray again the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite us to hear the scriptures at this point. So Brian and Cynthia are going to lead us in that. Um, and I'm going to ask us to read from the Bible because the projectors are uh, not going to display the words this morning. Thank you, Brian. I gave Brian a nice long passage of scripture today. It comes from Amos chapter 7, and I'm reading verses 7 to 17. If you'd like to follow, it's on page 1028 of this pew Bible. So it's Amos chapter 7, verses 7 to 17, and it's um, page 1028 of this pew Bible. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb. With a plumb line in hand, and the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaiah will be destroyed, and the statues of Israel will be renewed. With my sword, I will rise against those, the house of Jer Jeroboam. Then Amazah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot be all its words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from the native land. Then Amazah said to Amos, get out, you, you sir, go back to the land of Judea, earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of synagogue fig tree. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people, Israel. Now then hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaiah. Then, therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will come a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and yourself will die in pagan country, and Israel will certainly go into exile, away from their native land. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> I'm reading from Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 to 14 and it's found on page 251 Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossia 
grace and peace to you from God, our Father. Thanksgiving and prayer. We always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus <coughs> and of all the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth. The gospel that has come to you all over the world, this gospel is produced, is, pr is producing fruit and growing just as it has been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and understood of God's grace in all its truth. You learnt it from Ephorus, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray this is in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here endeth the word of our God. Amen.
We are thankful to the choir for that reminder of the gospel, that Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. As Revelation says, if anyone wants to invite him in, we must open the door. Um, so thank you to the choir and Jill for leading us in the anthem. I'm going to ask us to take up our offerings and our tithes at this point. And the stewards can wait on us as we, as we remain seated. We'll sing... Uh, how can we sinners know it's hymn number 728? And if the stewards could just take up our tithes, please. Lord God, we invite you to receive these gifts that we've given to you from our hearts, Lord God. May you take them and use them for your kingdom's sake. We know, Lord, that our land and especially our city is in great need. So may you use us as your people, combined with these material gifts as well as the gifts of your spirit, to bring your gospel into this place. In Jesus' name, amen. going to ask Dennis to come and to lead us in our prayers for other people. Um, as you know, on Communion Sunday, we especially have this prayer, paragraph 14. Where's your hat today, Dennis? Item 14, let us make intercession for others. Help as we pray for those in need. 
We pray for the church in South Africa that we might be faithful to our calling and stand for justice and truth. May we constantly be renewed by your Holy Spirit for mission and service. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our country and its people. May we find justice, freedom, and peace for all people. We pray for the state president and all in authority that they may serve our land with wisdom, honesty, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who protect us, that violence may cease, and peace and truth prevail. We pray for our youth growing up in a complex society, and we ask for stability and courage, that they may be able to face the challenges of the day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in sorrow, need, anxiety, and sickness. We pray for the lonely and persecuted, and for all who suffer from cruelty, injustice, and neglect. In their weakness, may they know your strength, and in their despair, find hope. Lord, in your mercy. I'm going to do the third reading in a moment, but if you want to turn to Luke 10, you can do that. Um, But I'm going to get into just sharing first, and then we will we'll read that reading kind of in the middle of the message, if that makes sense. Um, the, this morning's readings, in case you were wondering what Amos was doing in the middle of the, the readings there, Brian. Um, the, this morning's readings have been uh, set through the lectionary, and I think some of you know what the lectionary is. But uh, the lectionary was designed many, many, many years ago to kind of help us read through the scriptures in a systematic way. Um, if you were in church every Sunday for three years, you would basically read through the whole Bible. Um, that's, that's how it's set. So often you will find that there are three or four readings uh, for a Sunday. Now, we don't always use the lectionary, as you know, because we use, usually use preaching themes and that. But for this Sunday, I thought the lectionary readings uh, were very appropriate. Um, the idea is to try and find the link between the readings, which sometimes isn't easy. I mean, when you read Amos's reading, it seems a little bit... Um, depressing, to be honest, um, but there is always good news, always good news in the scriptures. And I'm going to ask if Haley can just put on the, the screen for us um, just some pictures as we, as we go through the, the, the sermon. So I'm sorry there's no sermon notes, but I invite you to make uh, some notes of your own if you'd like to do that. So, so very simply, um, I'm just going to give you an overview of Amos before I move on. The, um, the message that comes through from Amos, if you read before the reading that Brian uh, Brian read, is actually where God is speaking um, about how he's going to destroy the Israelite people. Uh, he's going to send a plague of locusts, I think is the first one, uh, and then it's a plague of fire, and then he uses the plumb line. And um, ultimately in all of that, uh, Amos pleads with God, and God grants the people mercy. And uh, eventually God says, okay, well enough is enough. And then he sends Amos as the prophet And there's a very important quote in in Amos chapter 7 where Amos says this, because the people are obviously very upset with the way he's he's sharing his prophecy. And uh, Amos replies to them, it's in verse 14 and 15 of Amos 7, I am not a professional prophet. I was never trained to be one. I'm just a shepherd, and I take care of sycamore fig trees. Basically, he's a gardener, really. Um, but the Lord called me away from my flock and told me, go and prophesy to my people in Israel. Now, now the thing I would like us to hold on to before we look at the other scriptures is that we, we've heard this before, but Amos is another classic example of this, of how God takes an ordinary person, a gardener, and he equips them to be a messenger of good news or to be a prophet. If you, if you look at Many of the other examples of people in the scriptures, um, even in the Old Testament, someone like David, who was also a shepherd, uh, Gideon, who was 
sort of a, a, a wine farmer in a way. Um, God ta- took those ordinary people and allowed them to be used for his kingdom and for his, his message uh, to, to be portrayed. Now hold that thought in mind as I tell you a story, a very true story. If you're going to put on the next picture for us, please, Heidi. Last week in, in Israel, so this is a true story. This is a picture of an accident that took place. You see the car on the right-hand side. The right-hand side vehicle was carrying a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Mark um, and his wife and two of his children, and they were driving on the highway between uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. Those of us who were in Israel a few weeks ago, the same road we drove on. So this happened last week. Rabbi Mark was uh, assassinated by a Palestinian sniper. So he was driving and he was shot and the car overturned. And uh, he was killed instantly. His wife was left unconscious and his two, his t- two children were, were wounded. The very next, so he was a rabbi, Jewish rabbi. And you know what's happening in Israel. I don't have to explain to you what's happening in, in Israel between the Palestinians and the Jews and that whole thing. It's complicated. The next vehicle that came across uh, this accident, if you want to put the picture on for us, was Dr. Ali Sakub, a Palestinian doctor, who immediately when he came across the accident, uh, the, the humanity in him said there's people who are in need. Okay? So he got out of his car with his brother, with his brother there sitting in the chair, and uh, they, they saw that the uh, doctor didn't know him yet, but they saw the rabbi was dead, but saw the wife was unconscious, pulled them out of the car, smashed the back windows open to pull the children out, and, and basically started, like a doctor would, saving their lives. The next cars that came uh, on the accident eventually started saying to him, you better get out of here because you are a Palestinian, and this is a Jewish family in occupied territory, they're going to think that you are the one who was involved in this and they're going to kill you. But Dr. Ali Sakub was only concerned about making sure the family was safe. And when they were safe, when the ambulance came, he, um, he then, that they left for their own safety. Um, but the, he, he, let's go to the next picture. This is, this is the daughter, Talia, who was in the back seat of the car. She is here. That, that's... Sadly, the picture of her father at his funeral. Um, she is alive because Dr. Ali Sakub, a Palestinian, chose to save her life, a Jewish, a Jewish lady. At the funeral, and this is, uh, I read this on a couple of different uh, news websites. At the funeral, many of the Israeli people, particularly the young, young men, were demanding, and this is the scene of the funeral, many of the young men were demanding revenge, okay? Uh, Chants like, kill the Palestinians, kill the Arabs, so on. And it was her, Talia, and uh, other members of the family who actually stood up and said, we don't want that talk here at the funeral because our father was a peace-loving man And the people that actually saved our lives were Palestinians, were Arabs. Maybe we don't get the full impact of it in some way, but let me read you the story that Jesus told 2,000 years before this story and see if it makes more sense. So a lawyer has come to Jesus asking him, how do I get eternal life? And Jesus has asked him, well, what do you think? And he has said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The lawyer thinks he's being very tricky, and he says, well, who is my neighbor? I think you know the story, but let me read it for you. In his reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they beat him, they stripped him of his clothes, clothes and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. 
So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, look at the picture of Judea. Samaria is up at the top. It's a bit small maybe to see from the back, but Jerusalem is there in Jericho. Jerusalem's kind of in the middle. Jericho is on the right-hand side, just above the Dead Sea. As we remember, Samaritans were despised by the Jewish people. They were hated, exactly as, as things are today between the Arabs and the, and, the, and the Israeli people. A Samaritan was traveling by when he... Um, sorry, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on, and wine. Then he put the man on a donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver co coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense which you may have. Jesus then confronts the lawyer, says to him, which of, you, uh, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And I'll leave his answer for later. I think you know his answer. Could you just put the next slide on for us, please, Haiti? This is the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And uh, as you can see, I mean, uh, sometimes I think when we take our context and we try and put it into the Bible context, we imagine the road maybe a little bit like a highway, but it wasn't. It's like this. So you can see that when the man uh, is confronted by the robbers, he's either going to be killed or he's going to be thrown down the mountainside. So he, he, he's, he's there. Um, this road... In the time of Jesus and even now, it has been known as the way of blood, this road, because of so many people who were hijacked on this road. And so we know from many sermons on the Good Samaritan, and many of you can preach a sermon to me on the Good Samaritan, the Levite and the priest didn't help the Samaritan more than likely for religious reasons. Because either he was, they thought he was dead, or he was very definitely very bloodied up, and they didn't want to be made unclean. They had, they had probably been to the temple already, and they were nice and holy. It's like you'll be after the service today, you'll be holy. They were nice and holy. And this guy, they could clearly see he was not Jewish. We don't want to be tainted by this guy, either physically with the blood or just by mixing with the Samaritans. It was just not done. And so they walked by, and then... I mean, the Samaritan came by and, and he helped, helped them out. The story of Dr. Ali Zakub and uh, Rabbi Mark's family has got as much response in 2016 as the parable of the Good Samaritan got in Jesus' time, where people have said, no ways, just not possible. It's just no way an Arab, a Palestinian, the enemy would actually help a Jewish family. So for many Jewish people, they've, on the one hand, they've said just no ways, but what it's begun to do is fill people with a sense of hope. And, and, and Dr. Ali Zakub, when he came past, he said he wasn't interested in whether the person was an Arab or a Jew or a Christian. He was just concerned about the fact that they were in need and he needed to help. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, preached a wonderful sermon, or a speech, depending on the way you look at it, on the night before he was assassinated. His great speech was called, I've Been to the Mountain, the Mountaintop. And he wrote a story, or an account, of when he walked on this road with his wife in Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he said this, I'm going to quote, that's a very dangerous road, and in the days of Jesus it came to be known as the bloody pass. And you know it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. And I think all of us would have probably thought the same thing. But it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking, and he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them and lure them for some quick and easy seizure. And so the first question the priest asked, and the first question the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? It's a very fair question. However, Dr. Martin Luther King continues, but when the Good Samaritan came by, he reversed the question and he said, and this is for us today the thing, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? 
And let's be honest, we live in a world where everyone asks the first question. If I stop and help you, what is going to happen to me? How much time is it going to cost me? How much effort is it going to cost me? And look, we live in a world where it is crazy, so you don't want to stop and help someone because maybe they're going to hijack you. But Dr. Martin Luther King puts something into my mind, which I think Dr. Ali Zakub also does, is say, is what is going to happen to that person? Is it possible that God has placed you or myself in a situation or, or wherever he places us so that we could be the next person coming across the accident? When Jesus asked the man the question, which of these three guys do you think was um, the neighbor to, the, Samar to, to the, the man, the robber? Do you remember what the response was? I'll read it for you. The expert in the law reminded, uh, replied, the one who had mercy on him. Do you notice that he couldn't even get out the words, the Samaritan? So despised the Samaritans, he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said the guy who had mercy. It's almost like coming across a lion supporter on the ground, ble bleeding. And a shark's guy comes across, you know. And the lion's guys can't even say, yo, oh, that shark's fan, you know. But, uh, but on a more serious note, you know, we we are going to be surprised, as Bob said in the beginning, as to who we in heaven with one day. But in our country, we are so used to being divided, and this person fits there, that person fits there. Even in the church, we do it. But when we look beyond the facade of everybody around us, we actually see that we are all children of God. And... Uh, the Samaritan reminds us so much of the role that we have to play. Now, let me come to Colossians as we come to a close. Colossians um, is a, I mean, it's a wonderful book. Colossians chapter 1 reminds us, if you read it again, that God has called us to get along all, all kinds of people. So it's exactly the same as the story of the, of the Samaritan. And, and what, if you're going to put in the next picture for us, Heidi, what, what Colossians reminds us is that all of us here today, we live in what we call two dimensions. Not, not in 3D, we live in 2D. And the two dimensions we find ourselves living in is we live in the world, but we also live in Christ. That's what Paul says to the church in Colossae. He says to them that we, we live in Christ, but Christ has also placed us in this world. Now, let me read you a quote from my friend William Barclay. He says this, In this world, a Christian, us may move from place to place, but wherever he or she finds themselves, we are in Christ. So the story of the Good Samaritan, if I'm in Jericho, I'm in Christ. If I'm in Jerusalem, I'm in Christ. If you're in Wesley this morning, you're in Christ. If you're at another church, you're in Christ. If you live in Cape Town or Joburg, you're in Christ. You may live there in that place. You could be overseas. If you, if you live there, you live in that dimension. But we, those of us who've chosen to open the door to Christ, we live in Christ. Now, if that's the dimension we live in, we also must remember that in Colossians 1, it reminds us we have a double commitment. So it's all the twos today. We live in two dimensions, the world but in Christ, and our double commitment is to follow Christ, to be committed to Jesus, but also to walk alongside our fellow human beings. I don't need to remind us that the message of the gospel is Jesus the word made flesh going to all the people that the religious guys didn't want to hang around with. I think I said it a few weeks ago that many of the stories of the Gospels take place out in the world. Only a few of them take place in the synagogue. Most of them are where the ordinary people were and they were needing to find the hope that Jesus came to give them. I came across this quote and I links in with verse 9, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Let me read Paul's word, and then I'll just read you the quote. Paul says, 
Um, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Now when you read that in the original language, the spiritual wisdom is what is called Sophia. Sophia is spiritual wisdom and it's about knowing what is right, knowing about what one should do. But the other word that Paul used there is the word understanding, and it's basically about knowing what is right and then putting it into practice. Okay, so Colossians challenges us, you need to know what is right, but then also put it into practice. So let's come back to the Good Samaritan, the Levites and the priests. They knew what was right, but they couldn't put it into practice. They were bound by their law. Dr. Ali Yakub Sakub driving past, he knew what was right, and even in the back of his mind, he's probably thinking to himself, I'm a Palestinian, they're Jewish, this is not going to work out well. But there was something in him that moved him in humanity to save and to help that family. Here's the quote. We can quite easily be a master of theology and a failure in living. That hit me across the head this week because I have a master in theology and I thought to myself, yeesh, we can quite easily have a, be a master in theology and a failure in living. So the story of the Good Samaritan for me says it's not how much we know about God that's important, but it's how we take our knowledge and how we live it out. Come back to the lawyer who asked Jesus the question. He knew the answers. He knew what he needed to do, but he wasn't able to do it. That's why Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and have mercy on those people you come across. I don't know if any of you know this, and I, I, probably not because we don't really follow the Catholic, um, maybe, maybe it's some of the Catholic liturgies, but this year, Pope Francis has called for a year of mercy. You know that? I didn't know that. 2016 is a year of mercy. And I think if we hear the story of the Good Samaritan and the, the word from Amos and even the word from Colossians, God is challenging us as a community of faith to say, we are going to come across many people. Even this week, we will come across people who are in desperate need, maybe like the robber on the side of the road. Maybe not physically broken, but spiritually broken. And God is calling us to show mercy. God is calling us to be like that good Samaritan, to show the love that has transformed our lives and to reach out to those who are in need. And so I'm going to leave that for us to think about. I'm going to close off with the words from Colossians 1, 11 to 13. And then we're going to celebrate the greatest gift of mercy ever given to humankind. So here's a prayer for us. I'll read it from Colossians. We pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and the patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins just as God showed us mercy, may we show mercy to others. Amen. Friends, just for the sake of um, time, I'm just going to ask us to reflect on what communion means for each one of us and to remind us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took both bread and wine, and he blessed it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And then he took one of the cups after the supper, and he blessed it, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this meal, as you eat the bread and you drink the wine, you do this in remembrance of me. And so in, in that uh, 
in that vein today we share in the gospel of God's mercy and grace as we share in communion together. Amen. I'm going to ask the stewards if you would come and just share with me first, the rest of us, if we could just prepare our hearts for Holy Communion. As you receive the body of Christ, I pray that it may sustain you. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is the blood of Christ that was spilled for each one of us. Amen. We thank God for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that's prepared for all of us. Amen. Just before we close our service, uh, I see Henry is here. Uh, Henry, welcome. Would you like to come and uh, just uh, share in the 10 Spearman Road cleanup? Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I just... I um, want to say how overwhelmed I was with the response we had to the first cleanup a month ago. And we got pretty far, but there's still a, a lot to do. But we've made a start, and we can see progress that's, that's happened. And yeah, this is the reason for the next cleanup. And we're just going to clean some rubble, and there's a whole lot of bricks that are there that um, we want to get out of the yard. But if anyone's interested in them, give me a shout, and we can have them picked up, or you can pick them up. Um, um, want to clean the gutters and remove all the rubble and start preparing the wooden windows and doors for for painting. You know, we've got quite a lot of broken windows and it's going to be quite costly. But um, we've had a guy come in and had a look at the the wooden doors and frames for us and given me a, some advice. So we're going to start on that next Sunday or next Saturday. And I just invite everyone that's able to come along and make a contribution, whether it's for five minutes or the full three hours. You're most welcome, and we really appreciate it. This is a very um, important initiative for the church, and we hope we can have it ongoing and see the progress as we go along. Thank you very much. And uh, as, as Bob mentioned at the beginning, it's not only for men. Uh, there's some uh, handy ladies out there too, so you can come along and also help out. Um, Thank you. 538 is the hymn we're going to sing to close our service off. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow, what a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly answered all of self and none of thee. Let's, let's sing together.
just a reminder of the WA cake sale after the service and to give Phil your names, gentlemen, if you want to come for the breakfast. Let's join hands together as we pronounce God's peace on one another. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.